Hello, Edgewater. So good to see you gathered here with us today. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Uh, I hope things are going well for you. Uh, uh, just please be sure, like we always say, keep in touch with uh, our, our, our website, our Facebook page to find out uh, all the information that's going on here at Edgewater. But I... I I, my blood is still pumping from that, uh, that bumper video just a second ago. I'm excited to start our, our summer Old Testament series this week. Uh, over the years, uh, we, we take some time over the summer to, to, to go through the Old Testament. We, over the first couple of years I was here, we did uh, a survey of the whole Old Testament. So we've covered basically everything. But we've had some special stops later on, uh, getting a chance to dive a little deeper into uh, the, the life of Moses and Esther and King David and Elijah and Elisha and Jonah and even Habakkuk. Uh, but this summer, we're going to spend some time walking through the book of Judges. Now, I've always liked the book of Judges, uh, lots of action and adventure, um, and, and a great picture of how God relates to us even today. It's not really a big surprise that I like Judges. As I've mentioned before, I'm kind of a, a comic book geek. Uh, the, the heroes that, that you find when you, when you read comics, they, they can do amazing things, but at the same time, there's always some type of weakness or a flaw. Superman is vulnerable to kryptonite. Daredevil sensitive to loud noises. Martian manhunter's weakness is fire. Green Lantern is vulnerable to yellow. The older version of Green Lantern was vulnerable to wood, so I guess a combination of the wood and yellow would make him extra vulnerable to a number two pencil. Um, well, one of, one of the things that I love about the Bible is that the only person in there who's perfect is Jesus. The Bible shows everyone as they really are, flaws and all. And to me, it kind of makes them a little more accessible that you can read in the New Testament, people like Paul that you look up to and they did so much for the furthering of the church of Jesus Christ and, and, and yet he had his flaws, he had his struggles, he had his sin in his life. They, all, the, these people that you read about, especially here in the book of, the, book of Judges, they go through the, a lot of the same struggles that I do. They have strengths and weaknesses, they make good decisions and bad decisions. There's a lot that we can learn from their stories. Let me, let me give you a little bit of background as we head into the book of Judges, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on some of the bigger themes as we go through as well. But kind of where it fits in the timeline of the people of Israel is it falls between um, Moses and, and the, the age of kings, like kings like Saul and David and Solomon. Uh, at that point, Israel was still kind of made up of the, the 12 tribes, and, and they were uh, traveling together, and they made their way into the promised land. Um, as we walk through Judges and, and heading into this time, there were lots of ups and downs. Uh, there were times that they, are, they were oppressed. There were times that, that they turn to God, and God delivers them. Uh, so, so the book of Judges is... is just kind of like a, a series of different stories and it's made up of lots of different stories that come together to tell the, the story of God's people. So what we're going to do today, we're just, we're going to jump in uh, and, and we're going to just hit the highlights on, on some of the major judges as we go through. Now, again, a, a judge, it's not, we're not talking about like people sitting at a, at a big high table with a black robe and a, and a white powdery wig with a, with a gavel. That's not the kind of judge we're talking about. While they did have some sometimes have some judging aspects to it, it was more along the lines of, of a deliverer, of a leader. Um, that, that was, that was kind of what they, they looked at when they were referring to these as judges. And so we're going to start in Judges chapter 3. And we're going to look at the story of Ehud. Now, in this story, you will see a, a, a kind of a flow that's repeated in, in many of the other stories. And even there's kind of an overarching flow in the same way through the story of Judges. It's kind of the same cycle over and over again. There, there's a point where things are kind of going the way that they should. And then the people make bad decisions um, they experience the consequence of their sin. They, they cry out to God, and then God sends a deliverer to make things the way that they should be, to, to restore things to wholeness or a sense of, of shalom. Uh, that that was, is the Hebrew word that, that, that talks about this idea of wholeness and peace that, that God brings about through these judges. Now, again, this pattern that we find in the book of Judges, it's not just confined to the book of Judges. We, we see it in our lives. 
And does any of that cycle kind of sound familiar to you? Anyone else out there ever made any bad decisions? You know, and then, and then deal with the consequences of those bad decisions. Sin has consequences, so we have to walk through that. And then, then what do we do? We cry out to God. We say things like, oh, if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again. Or I'll, I'll, I'll become a missionary. You know, and then God is faithful and, and he comes through. So where we, where we pick up the story today is, is kind of on the downswing of one of those cycles. So we're going to start in Judges chapter 3, verse 12. Where it says, once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. So what was the evil that, that occurred? What was kind of that downswing that they got involved in? All right, so again, just some background. The, the, the people of Israel were called to go to the promised land. God had set aside this place for his people to be so that they could live in this kind of covenant relationship with God. And from that location, then, they could show God's love and character to the world as they lived completely dedicated to him. Again, that, that strip of the promised land was located right kind of in the center of the world. If you were traveling between world powers, you had to go through that area. So it was just a great opportunity opportunity that anyone coming through that area would then get a chance to, to learn about the one true God. They'd get a chance to see what living in relationship with God really looks like. The, the problem was is, they, is that they didn't start out necessarily in that land. And, and so as, as they arrived back at the promised land, the people who lived in the land at that time, they didn't worship just one God. They, they worshiped lots of different gods. They had all sorts of different, different idols. And so by the end of Judges chapter 2, right before that verse that we just read, we find that because the Israelites didn't completely clear out the land like God had instructed them to do, they ran into people worshiping all these different gods and all these different idols, and they kind of found themselves caught up in idol worship. And so because of that evil, because of their turning away from kind of the, the one true God, God gave King Eglon control over Israel. Now let's take a, take a look at a map. We're going to put a map up um, to, to see where all of this takes place. So you can see kind of that the vertical line is the, the River Jordan. And, and you can see how it kind of flows down into the, the Dead Sea. On the, the east side... You find uh, the land of Moab uh, and the land of, of Ammon, which today that, that region is, basically, is Jordan. Um, the capital of Jordan today is Ammon, which comes from the, that Ammon. Um, and the Ammonites were the people who lived there. We'll talk a little bit more about them. Um, we'll run into them a few times through this series. And Moab, that section that's a little further south, um, is a plains area. And, and Moab is actually where Ruth is from. Ruth is the book in the Bible after Judges. And, and her story actually takes place during the time of the Judges. And so again, if you look at the map and, and now you see the, the western side, that's where, where the land of Canaan is. That's the promised land that the people were supposed to go into. And, and all of that area was, was divided up among the, the, the tribes of Israel and, but again, they had varying degrees of, of success in clearing out the land. Down in the southern area, the tribe of Judah really came through strong. As you read in kind of the earlier chapters in Judges, it kind of runs from south to north. And, and the, the people of Judah cleared it out, and they did a great job. And then the tribe just north of them, well, they did an okay job. But there were still some people, a couple cities that, that remain, remained in uh, the the control of the, the local people. And, and then as, as you proceed north, it gets worse and worse. And finally, you get up to the, to the tribe of Dan and, and, and it, it says, uh, yeah, the tribe of Dan basically hid in the mountains because they couldn't come down in the plains because every time they did, they got beat up. So uh, you, you saw just varying degrees of, of success in, in what they had uh, been instructed to do. So you saw that area of Moab. The king of Moab then had come across that Jordan River and they started to oppress the people. Again, this is, this is part of the, the consequence of sin part of the cycle. The, the, the Israelites did evil in God's sight and now they're having to pay the price for it. 
And so King Eglon then gets the, Amalite, uh, the, the Ammonites, that, that group a little further north, and the Amalekites, which is a little further south. They kind of all join forces together. Um, they get all these local people groups together, and, and they come across, and they actually take possession of the city of Jericho. And, and in verse 14, it goes on and it says, and the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. So basically, they had 18 years worth of consequences that they had to deal with. Now again, the, the sin that we, that we do in our lives, it has different consequences. Maybe, maybe the consequence lasts a day. Maybe the consequence lasts a couple years. Maybe it lasts 18 years. Maybe, maybe it's a consequence you have to deal with for the rest of your life. But sin does have consequences. So, so the Israelites then, as they walked through that 18 years of, of dealing with the consequences, they finally moved on to that next part of the cycle, and they cried out to God. Verse 15, the first part of that verse says, but when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them, a, a judge, a rescuer, a deliverer. Um, his name was Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed man from the tribe of Benjamin. Have you ever looked at scripture when you're reading through a section in the Bible and, and right there there's just something shows up that you wouldn't necessarily expect? I mean, you, you would have thought if they were, they were describing this, this rescuer that came in to save them, that, that they could have said, he had, he had a steely glint in his eye with muscles that rippled as he fought. But it goes, ah, he's left-handed. It seemed kind, kind of random. Um, but check this out. It says that he is from the tribe of Benjamin. And, and what the name Benjamin means, it actually means son of my right hand. So, so Benjamin was one of Jacob's, the, the, you remember the, the forefathers, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's sons uh, were the ones that the tribes were named after. Um, Benjamin was one of Jacob's favored sons. And so basically, the, the son of the right hand uh, was, was the son who is special and, and had power and had authority. And so here's Ehud, who's the son of the right hand, who's left-handed. Now, again, left-handed could mean a couple of different things. One, it could mean he was left-handed. Um, it could also have to do with this. The warriors of the tribe of Benjamin were actually known for being ambidextrous. They could use both hands, kind of a weird, weird fact that you read later on in the book of Judges. And so basically then they could use either hand in battle. And, or it could also mean, by calling him left-handed, it could mean that he had some type of problem with his right hand. Maybe he had a, a disability of some sort that, that he was forced to mo exclusively use the left hand. But here's the thing. Everyone in that culture wanted to be right-handed uh, because the, the right hand in that culture, the right hand represented the clean hand, the powerful hand, the favored hand. And so uh, people didn't want to be left-handed or being known as being left-handed. So Ehud is a left-handed man from the tribe of of Benjamin. And let's go on in the passage back in the rest of verse 15 and 16, where it says, the Israelites sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to Eglon, King Eglon of Moab. So Ehud made a double-edged dagger that was about a foot long, and he strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden under his clothing. So they had to pay off King Eglon, uh, I don't know, protection money. They had to pay tribute because he was the one who was oppressing them. Um, and, but he, um, he had made that dagger and he strapped it to his right leg because of course if you're, if you're right handed and you're going to draw a sword or a dagger you're going to pull it from your left side and so that's, that's where they would maybe look for any type of sword but to have it on the right side uh, that, that wouldn't happen as often so um, let's go on verse 17 it says uh, he brought the tribute money to Eglon who was very fat not necessarily the description you would, you would expect. This, this is a guy who, who had united these, these local people groups to, to oppress the Israelites. He had oppressed the people of Israel for 18 years. And all we know about him is he's fat. Um, so maybe, maybe that was kind of a, kind of a little dig at uh, the king of, of Moab. Uh, the passage goes on in verse 18 and 19. Where it says, after delivering the payment, Ehud started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. 
But when Ehud reached the stone idols near Gilgal, he turned back. He came to Eglon and said, I have a secret message for you. Now, let me talk about the significance of Gilgal for a second. Um, it's an area just to the west of the Jordan River. If you remember that map, you had the Jordan River. It, it would be just over the river on the, the western side. Um, and, and the importance of Gilgal comes from this. Back in the book of Joshua, as, as Joshua was leading the people into the promised land, they had crossed over the Jordan River. And God had instructed them as, as, he, as he parted parted the river and, and allowed them to walk through. Um, he, he told them that as they went through, they needed to take 12 large stones from the riverbed and they needed to take them to the western side, take them into the promised land and then get to a place where they would s- set the stones up as a memorial reminder of what God had done for them, about how he had delivered them, had been with them, delivered them from Egypt, took care of them through the wandering through the wilderness, got them into the promised land. And, and so he did this, at, they, they did this at Gilgal. So Gilgal was the place that they had these, these 12 stones set up. And so it was a reminder of God's power, or a reminder of his presence with them. But now in verse 19, all these years later, that same place that was a reminder of God's power and faithfulness, it's now a place filled with stone idols. It kind of shows how things had deteriorated. How, how the people of Israel were supposed to be a people that were solely dedicated to worshiping God. And yet now this place that had once been holy is just kind of filled with, with Baal statues and all sorts of other, other idols that were being worshipped. And so the, the worship of God there was diluted and, and the one true God was put on the ranks of these, these false gods kind of an evidence of their, their, their sin and their, their bad behavior. So Ehud at that point at Gilgal then turns around and heads back to King Eglon to deliver his secret message. So the second part of uh, Judges 3.19 says, so the king commanded his servants, be quiet. And he sent them all out of the room. So I guess we know something else about Eglon. Not only is he fat, he's not the brightest bulb in the chandelier. Because, I mean, here, here's a representative of the oppressed people and who has a secret message for you. And, he's gonna, and so you're going to clear everyone out, clear out all your protection, all your guards, and just meet one-on-one with this person. Well, let's see what, see what happened. In Judges 3, 20 and 21, it says, Ehud walked over to Eglon, who was sitting alone in a cool upstairs room. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. <laughs> kind of sounds like a, an Arnold Schwarzenegger line from one of his movies. I, I will spare you my really bad Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonation, but you can just hear it in your head. I have a message from God for you. Um, and, and it goes on and says, as King Eglon rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, pulled out the dagger strapped to his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. Now, just as a warning, the book of Judges is not rated G. So um, it goes on in verse 22, and it says, The dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat, so Ehud did not pull out the dagger, and the king's bowels emptied. Sorry, I'm just, just reading the Bible here. Um, so so he, he, he shoves in the dagger, and King Eglon was so fat, how fat was he? I don't know if you can say that anymore, but anyhow, <laughs> so this, this foot long dagger just kind of disappears and Ehud just leaves it there. Goes on and says in verse 23, then Ehud closed and locked the doors of the room and escaped down the latrine. All right, so the next, uh, climbs down through the potty and, and escapes out of the, the palace and uh, So verse 24 and 25, after Ehud was gone, the king's servants returned and found the doors to the upstairs room locked. They thought he might be using the latrine in the room, so they waited. They waited a while. They didn't want to be the one that interrupted the king. Um, And so they they waited and waited, and then, then maybe they just got to the point that they realized that smartphones hadn't been invented yet, and he was not scrolling through Instagram. Um, but the, the, so they, they went in, and uh, verse uh, 25, second part of the verse says, 
But when the king didn't come out after a long delay, they became concerned and got a key. And when they opened the doors, they found their master dead on the floor. Now, in that time frame that, the, uh, that they were all waiting, Ehud had time to escape and headed back through Gilgal to a place called Sarah. Um, and then this is where we pick up the story, verses 27 through 30, where it says, when he arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, Ehud sounded a call to arms. Then he led a band of Israelites down from the hills. Follow me, he said. Now, it's a band of Israelites, so again, it wasn't just the tribe of Benjamin. The other tribes around had kind of united together to help out here. He said, follow me, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab, your enemy. So they followed him. And the Israelites took control of the shallow crossings of the Jordan River across from Moab, preventing anyone from crossing. They attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of their strongest and most able-bodied warriors. Not one of them escaped. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for 80 years. Now let's, uh, as that part of the story wraps up, let's look at a few things here. First, we kind of get to see that that cycle continue to play out. The, remember, the people turned away from God. They were doing idol worship. They, they weren't just worshiping the one true God, they, Yahweh. They were, they were worshiping all sorts of things. Um, and so the consequence then was the 18 years of oppression from, from Moab. And then they cry out to God who raises this deliverer, this judge, who then brings them into this place of wholeness. Now, why am I using the word wholeness here? What did it say at the end of the, of the passage? It said, so Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for 80 years. Peace in Hebrew, as I mentioned earlier, is the word shalom. Um, and the word shalom doesn't mean that there's like no conflict at all. It just kind of means that everything is the way that it should be in God's world according to God's grace. So now through Ehud, God has brought the land back into shalom, in, into the sense of peace. And so the, the things were the way that they ought to be for 80 years. Now, in the book of Judges, there are three judges, three deliverers who bring about this, this period of shalom that ends up being longer than the oppression was. So again, Ehud, it said they had 18 years of oppression and then they had 80 years of shalom following that. Uh, the other two that bring about the, the greater period of shalom than the oppression was were uh, Othniel, who is actually the judge right before Ehud you could read about, and, and Deborah, who we're gonna look at next week. Um, Ehud brings the, the greatest season of peace if you've spent some time reading the Bible, um, you, you know that numbers are very important in the Bible. Uh, we talk about the number seven and how seven uh, represents uh, fullness. It, it's a special number. And, and so 70 is, is even better. You know, you got this, the place in the New Testament where Jesus is talking about forgiveness and, and how many times should we forgive? And he says seven times, 70 times. And, and so it's like fullness and then 10 times fullness. So it's not, it's not like a literal 490 times, and then, oh, I don't have to forgive you anymore. But um, so, so Ehud then brings them with 80 years of peace, he brings them to a place that is beyond fullness. Brings wholeness for a time that is beyond people's imagining. Remember this cycle that we just talked through today, it, it's gonna repeat itself throughout the book of Judges. And we'll see that phrase that we started the passage with a lot, where it says things like, once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. We'll see that all through the book of Judges. But the people do evil, they suffer the consequences, they cry out to God, and God delivers them. This is important. God is not just sitting around waiting to dole out consequences. The reality is, yes, we do have to deal with the consequences of sin, but, but really God is waiting on this side. God is, is waiting for us to turn and to cry out to him so that he can pour out his deliverance, his salvation, that he can pour out his wholeness on our behalf. He, he just cannot wait to do that for his people. 
No matter how many times they fail and fall and fail and fall and fail and fall, he cannot wait to bring help and wholeness. And the same thing, just like the cycle is in our lives, that same thing plays out in our lives as well. No matter how far you may have gone, no matter how many times you may have failed and fallen, God is just waiting to pour himself out on your behalf if you'll just turn to him. So as we go through the book of Judges, we find this, this cycle again. We also find kind of that the effects are diminishing. With, with the later Judges, um, the shalom doesn't last as long. Remember the, the three judges that brought about the longest periods of shalom, the, they were they're the first three in the book of Judges. And, and we find that, that it's partial a lot of times, that only certain tribes and areas are involved. What that's supposed to do in a literary way for us as a reader is to create a sense as we read through these stories to create a sense of, man, I wish there was just a way that there could finally be a king that would come and deliver all of the tribes and bring about a lasting shalom. They, we, we don't just want a, a judge here and a judge there who will help some of the people. Man, we want a king who can maybe come and take care of it all. And so that leads to, to Samuel, who's, who's kind of the last great judge who brings about the age of kings. The, like we said earlier, King Saul and King David and King Solomon. And, and these kings bring about a time of, of shalom and wholeness. But even those kings leave us longing for a different kind of king. Do you see where I'm headed here? All of these stories then are pointing us to the great king, the king of all kings, King Jesus. Who, who has come to deal with that failing and falling of humanity in a way that no one else can, to bring, to bring forth God's help and wholeness in a way that no one else can. And we are longing for that as an answer to our life's problems. So, so with all of these flawed heroes, all of these judges that we're going to read about, all of them in their own way point to Jesus. There, there's, there's one word that's kind of the, the linchpin, the turning point in all of these cycles, and it's not one of the, the four sections we talked about, but it's almost like the, 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 the point between two of them, and that's the word Repentance. Repentance. If you've been in church for a while, um, maybe your view of repentance is a little like this, you know, that, that, that I have to feel as bad as possible about myself for long enough until God will feel good enough to give me some grace. And if, if that's your view of repentance, let me just tell you, that's not what the word means. God's not really interested in making us feel terrible about ourselves for the rest of our lives. Repentance just means this, turning towards God. Again, in that cycle, we've got the, 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 the failing, the, the sin and the falling, the, the consequences of sin. And, and then there's that point of, of repentance. There's that verse that we kind of flew by in the beginning of this passage where it said, the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. So, so there is that key place in our story as human beings where we find ourselves having fallen and we're living in the consequences of our sin and our bad decisions. And, and while God is the one who, who delivers us and restores us to that place of wholeness, there is that one moment, that one action that is required of us, kind of like a key unlocking a door. And that's where we repent, where we turn, where we turn from our idols. We turn from our self-sufficiency. We recognize that in the midst of our failing and our falling and our failing and our falling, we've just kind of ended up in the ditch. And I need help. I need a helper. I need a deliverer. I need a leader. I need a savior that is going to bring me help and wholeness that I cannot bring myself. Now, you may have been in church for a while or you and, and you may hear all of this, and you may say, oh, well, I did that once, you know, back in third grade, Sunday school class, or, or back in youth group, or back when I first started following Jesus. But 
the humbling part of judges is that these are God's people and yet they keep turning away. And so I would suggest that maybe each and every one of us needs to keep turning, that we need to keep turning to God. Maybe we don't bow down to, to little carved idols, but maybe we still have our idols. Maybe, maybe right next to our memorial stones where we have our, our, our memorial stones to God, remembering what God has done, maybe we also have memorial stones to money and sex and power and addictions. It's time to turn from those things and turn back to God. Maybe some of you watching today, maybe you've never even made that first turn. And, and you, you just have kind of found yourself stuck on this side of the cycle, just the failing and falling and failing and falling and failing and falling. And I got to tell you, there's no way that you can get out of it on your own. And so maybe today would you consider turning to God, repenting, crying out to him for help because he's just waiting to come and deliver. Please pray with me. God, thank you so much for who you are. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Even in those times that, that we are not faithful, you are, you are faithful. And, and I thank you, God, that you are waiting, you, that we don't have to like jump through hoops and, and, and do a certain number of, of good deeds to finally get your attention to turn to us. But in those moments after, after failing and falling and failing and falling, when we just turn to you, when we repent and turn to you, that you are right there waiting to pour out your peace and your wholeness and your restoration, your deliverance. And so God, whatever it is that we may be facing today, whatever situations that we may find ourselves in, God, I pray that you will help us to turn to you, to make that just a part of our, our daily lives so that we, so we, we don't have to make big course corrections. We can just make those little course corrections every single day to keep on track with you. And we thank you, God, that you love us enough that you're ready to come and deliver. Maybe as you've been listening today, maybe you're ready to make that first turn. Maybe, maybe you've been coming to church for a while. Maybe you've been watching online for a while. But, but you've never taken that step for yourself because it's, it's not a culture thing. It's not a family thing. You, you don't get delivered by God because your grandma went to church. It's a decision that you have to make because it's, it's your sin, it's your consequences of sin that you're dealing with and so you have to make the decision to turn. And maybe today's the day you're like, you know, I wanna do that. You're just, you're feeling that it's the right time. Well, I'm so excited that, that it is. And so one of the ways that we kind of mark this, this turning point, this beginning of following the, the example of Jesus and, and experiencing God's deliverance and, and wholeness we kind of commemorate the time with a, a little prayer and it kind of becomes a, one of those stones as a reminder for us. And, and even then for those of us who pray this prayer just about every single week, we get a chance to remember. And so I invite you today to, uh, to pray this prayer with me. Just repeat it out loud, phrase by phrase. And pray, dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin. Please forgive me for everything I've done wrong. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.